I guess I'll go first. This is Linda Woods. I'm at San Diego State University, and I'm an instructional designer in the Instructional Technology Services Department. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Monica Munoz. I'm also an instructional designer from San Francisco State University. And we'll leave R for later if they show up. Uh, I'm Ruth Guthrie, and uh, Teresa Dykes, you might know her. She's our helper for the OER Council, and I'm, a fa I'm on the council, and I'm a faculty member at um, Pomona, Cal Poly Pomona, and I teach in the College of Business and Computer Information Systems. Uh, so the topic for today's webinar is getting started with and finding OER resources. And since you're in the instructional design, you know, maybe you're more of an expert on this than I am. We'll see, but uh, feel free to interrupt and chime in. And you know, if you use that chat window, I probably won't see it, so you might have to give me a little kick to notice. All right, I, th I thought what we'd start with is the language in the bill that says what are OER, because a lot of people are, as a council, we've been very, very focused on textbooks, but it's more than that. It's the definition in that bill is to look at OER in a much more broad, way, but high quality teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license such as Creative Commons. Um, so it's for free use, repurposing by others, and may include other resources that are legally available and free of cost to students. So I don't know if your campuses have something like Safari Books Online, do you guys have that? Sorry, no, webinar is hard to do <laughs> with interactive commenting. No, um, we have that at Cal Poly Pomona, and it's free books online. And in my program, in my discipline, there's lots of technical books, and they're out of date six months after they're printed. But the Safari Books Online, if you look for a book on database management or something like that, you can find ten books that are up to date, and students have access to that through the library. 24-7, and instructors, some instructors have used those in their courses very successfully and free to students. The only limit may be how many students can look at the book at one time. And I understand that some libraries figure that out, and so they pay more for specific books and things like that. But it's free to the students, so that's a nice thing. The other piece of this from the bill is uh, resources include but are not limited to full courses. I'm sure as instructional designers, you must have seen full courses that are online, sometimes in a course management sim system, sometimes not, sometimes they're just free. Course materials, modules, textbooks, faculty created content, streaming videos. In the adoption study that the council just did, two people adopted modules from Khan Academy and used the videos to be part of the class. Um, tests, software, and other tools that are free to students, and uh, so forth. So it's, the bill is intended to think of it as broader than a textbook. How familiar, or I guess I won't ask questions, I'll just go through this quickly. Um, Creative Commons licensing, is, Creative Commons is an organization that sought to make copyright more lenient because lots of people wanted to share their co their content, but strict copyright rules are very restrictive. You can't change it. You can't redistribute it. You know, very strict with traditional copyright. But with Creative Commons licensing, it's a lot looser. And the the gold standard for something in OER materials is CC BY, and that means all you have to do is acknowledge that the person wrote that work, and then you are free to change it, share it redistribute it, you could even charge money for it and make a profit, uh, you know, with your work, your derivative work based on somebody else's um, really great. And lots of faculty seem to be having a growing interest in modifying people's materials and sharing it with a bigger community. The other um, CC, the other um, things, they, there's a, the next slide I'll show you different licenses, but non-commercial. If you see that dollar sign with the no through it, that means the person prohibits you from profiting off that work. No derivative works. If you see an equal sign, that means you can't edit it or remix it. But really, the spirit of 
OER for our purposes is that it will be remixed and redistributed and re-edited. And then share alike, the arrow circle backward C looking thing means once you remix it, you're going to share it like the other license did so that other people can benefit from that also. Uh, this graphic I got from uh, milosgenata.com because I, I was doing this this morning because I was out at a Laker game last night and I didn't have time to create my own graphic, so I borrowed this. But it's nice. It gives the licenses and tells you what you can do and what the requirement is. So the, at the top is CC BY, share, remix, make money, anything you want with the CC BY. All right, I'll um, quit on that, and I hope that's not all. Well, I hope it is new to you, because then you're that far ahead. All right, case studies of OER use. And you know, as a council, Cool for Ed was a, a product of what we've been working on for a year and a half, so we really push a lot of Cool for Ed, and a neat thing in Cool for Ed are these faculty showcases of people that used OER textbooks. So I just listed three examples because I found something in those showcases that uh, I thought was really good. One, public speaking. Mark Stoner is a professor at Sac State, and what I saw in his uh, showcase was he really spoke to the quality of the book and he said this is no different from any other public speaking book and uh, lots of my students work 25 hours a week and they can't afford the textbooks and uh, you know it's just really nice that that resource is available to them and public speaking is typically something that has lots and lots of sections so if you're looking for bang for your buck and a, a good book that might uh, support that kind of thing, public speaking might be a course that you'd look at in including in your plan for um, AB 798. Uh, we had somebody in our study that did a public speaking course, and the one thing they said was uh, they wished the book had videos, video examples that came with it. And so maybe somebody's university plan would look like in the first semester adopting a, the, a free public speaking textbook and developing uh, videos or seeking videos that they could um, integrate with that course. And maybe that would look like a single course adoption in the fall, and then if they have five sections or eight sections of that course, do an eight course textbook adoption in the spring. and. Uh, you know, calculate your savings from that and hopefully have a successful OER adoption. The second uh, profile I showcase I chose was chemistry because uh, ChemWiki is one of the most famous examples of OER adoption uh, that there is. Do you get, oh, sorry, no questions, just broadcast. Um, so ChemWiki was developed out of Davis, and it was a wiki-style chemistry text. And uh, when I first started learning about OER, I went to my daughters, who both suffered through chemistry, and I said, so we're, I'm looking at this thing called ChemWiki. And they're like, oh, I know ChemWiki. I use it for this and this and this. And they were very, very familiar with ChemWiki. And lots of chemistry professors are also. Um, and ChemWiki off, it's, uh, wiki books are sometimes criticized because maybe hard to follow and things like the, that, and a common voice, but ChemWiki has really worked to improve that quality, and they've also um, done uh, custom books for different universities that adopt content from ChemWiki, which I think is really good, and it's kind of neat that they have uh, interactive content and links with the web book. Chemistry also has a book that's done by OpenStax, which is probably the gold standard for OER publishers. They have a chemistry book with uh, fully supported PowerPoint slides and test banks and things like that. But uh, ChemWiki, the, what I liked about Ron Rosset from Diablo Valley College and his portfolio, he wrote about the collaboration that ChemWiki, you know, he'd been working with ChemWiki for some years and things like that in a collaborative effort to bring free re chemistry resources to students. I was very impressed with that. And the last book I picked was Sociology by Vera Kennedy at West Hills College. And what I liked about that was she actually measured. A lot of the portfolio showcases you'll see will say, 
no measures taken. Anecdotally, I think the students learned better or learned just as well, or, you know, or they comment on the quality of the book. But Vera did take um, measurements based on the learning outcomes and and uh, not retention, of course, content, but people's retention in the um, course. So uh, as we think about measurement and how you, how you can show that the adoption successful, I thought that was a good example of that. All right, and then sorry, Monica, because she's already heard me rave about my OER adoption. My own OER adop adoption at Cal Poly was for a course called Management Information Systems. And Cal Poly actually gave me a grant to develop some materials so we could use this book that's available for free at sailor.org, Information Systems for Business and Beyond by David Bourgeois. And the original text for the course was from, I don't remember the publisher, but it was $139. And people did not like the textbook. And so I found we did a committee of three faculty to look through three different open source textbooks. And we only found one that we really liked, and that was the Information Systems for Business and Beyond text, which is free. But we wanted to add a couple of chapters, and we did have to build PowerPoint presentations and um, test bank for this. And building a test bank is a very boring job. Uh, so um, the good thing was faculty got assigned time to develop these materials. And, uh, and I was so green to OER adoption, I couldn't believe that I could edit this guy's book. And uh, so I emailed him. And he emailed me back and said, yeah, go ahead. You can do whatever you want with it. And he had really bought into OER and was very supportive of um, the OER movement and everything. So the great outcomes for us, oh, and this is a course where we have uh, like 15 sections a year with 70 students in each section and um, taught mostly by adjunct faculty. So the great outcomes after we adopted it were, of course, $167,000 savings for students. So the student response was overwhelmingly good. Of course, they loved saving that money and were very, very happy. The textbook also is maybe a little less, uh, uh, it's, no, it's a course that's known as very much kill and grill, and you memorize a lot of terms. And maybe the focus of the course is more towards thinking and applying than memorization now, which I think is a, was a much needed change. It's a 300 level course. It's the adjunct faculty were the people that made this course work because they had so much experience teaching the course and so much experience with the content that when I gave them a book that didn't have all the materials, anything that they saw was missing, they just filled it in themselves. And they were so willing and able to participate in this. They really, without them, it would have, this would have never succeeded. Um, Changing the text, it was really neat that we had an opportunity to alter the text to add more content. And then I started getting, we put it on a public web page, not just in Blackboard, which is our learning management system. And it was nice to have other universities. Dartmouth um, was one. And then the original author of the text wanted some of the materials we developed. And it's open to anyone who's searching for the web will find that page. And they can download everything except the test bank, because we didn't feel like we should share that. We, we also built a quizzing system that's got interactive quizzes where people can do um, flashcards or little mini games to go through the vocabulary and the chapters and things like that. The challenges, though, were it was challenging to build all those support materials, but we're almost seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on that. So I'm super looking forward to next year. And then I'd say configuration management. We didn't do a good job of saying, this is how page numbering will be done. This is how you add another chapter and don't screw up your page numbering. Or people who did the test bank gave their test bank questions in all kinds of different formats. And they had to be reformatted. And if we had put a little more work in up front, I think we would have saved a lot of time. But overall, a great success and uh, great savings. So that was super, super nice. All right, back to Cool for Ed. Uh, um, it was developed over the past two years. And it's got 50 of the, it leverages Merlot's uh, services, but it's got 50 of the high 
uh, enrolled courses that cross the university systems and reviews by faculty from all three systems. So there's reviews by the CSU, reviews by the UC, and reviews by the community colleges. And not all the reviews are great. Um, so, so I'd encourage you to look or have your faculty look at uh, what book might uh, work for them. There's also course showcases. We looked at that. Reviews of e-textbooks uh, and faculty showcases. I went over that. And uh, then one more thing that I think is going to be useful on my campus as they develop their own plan, there's a list that Teresa put together of highly rated texts from Cool for Ed. Because if you go to that Cool for Ed site, it's very, there's a lot of reviews and a lot of courses. And you have to click to see what people said. But if you click on this list, it's located on the Cool for Ed site, um, the highly rated textbooks. And these are books that got high ratings from lots of faculty. And you can go and see what those books are. And there's, I don't know, Teresa, what do you think? Like 20 different book textbooks that are highly rated? Yeah, I would say. Yeah. If, um, if not a little bit more, yeah. And then to pl the last part of this webinar was, uh, where do you find OER resources? And I would. And I made an OER bingo card, <laughs> and the link is there, and you can see it I don't, just because it was kind of fun, and it was a way I tried to communicate to my faculty, these are places you can look for OER resources. But I'll just talk about four different resources that are pretty popular. OpenStax, like I said, that's the number one place you can look for textbooks. And uh, and the textbooks are very high quality and very well supported. Um, and uh, I did see the chat. Thanks for the comment on the bing on the magnet. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, well supported with support materials and PowerPoints and test banks. So that's really nice. If you're trying to sell faculty who are, who can't switch a book because they they really need the ancillary materials from the textbook, OpenStack probably is a good solution for that. Sailor Academy has a long list of textbooks, and they're available in every format you could think of, and a really nice list of uh, in different disciplines. BC Campus out of Can Canada has a lot of books also. And then Boundless is more of a commercial company that has uh, lots of textbooks in, again, highly, highly high volume disciplines and things like that. And uh, uh, OpenStax you can, are free PDFs. The textbook might cost between $30 and $50 if the student wants a hard copy. And I tell you, if you've seen those books, it's incredible. A book that you would normally, physically, you think, oh, that's a $200 textbook. They've got it for you for 50 bucks. Incredible. And the PDF's free. Boundless also, I think, will print a textbook and send it to you. But they've got web-based versions of the books, um, too. OK, but back to what we started talking about at the beginning of our time. What about OER that isn't a textbook? Because our council is very textbook centric. But there's a lot of people that use open resources that are not OER textbooks. They're, they're full courses, course materials, videos, materials developed by faculty, different things. And there, there are a lot of materials out there. And uh, I mentioned earlier, people have used Khan Academy videos, Safari Books Online, faculty created OER, courseware, modules created with many sources. And Merlot is a very, you have to dig a lot, but it's a very good way to point yourself in the direction of OER resources. Um, I, I had the pleasure of attending uh, Cal State San Marcos's OER Day, and they have a huge program called Calming Courses Down, C-A-L-M. And what they do is faculty come to the instructional designers and say, I want to reduce the cost for my course. And their courses do not use the three I saw in a panel when I was there. They didn't really use a textbook. Uh, they used original sources. They used free sources they found online. And the course in the LMS was really built out of Lots of different sources, but and they worked very, very closely with instructional designers. But it was a very, uh, I don't think the student would be confused by having all these different links, because it was so nicely organized. And they've been very successful with their program. 
And so at the end of the panel discussion, I said, well, have you thought about putting this course in the public domain? Because, you know, how great would that be? And they had, the faculty hadn't actually thought about that. But you know what? Maybe that's the future, somebody being able to take a fully developed course. One was in film. One was in, uh, I don't remember. But, uh, you know, maybe that's a future thing for a faculty member. Uh, I think I skipped one thing in my own OER adoption, back to the faculty and getting their buy-in. Ah, so the buy-in for me, for my own self, was uh, being able to publish something about what I've done. And lots of disciplines have uh, subsections of big conferences that are related to education and making education accessible to students. And so I submitted a paper. Uh, about a month ago to AMSIS, which is in San Diego this year. And I hope it's accepted. We'll see. And there are other, I guess I'm going to put together a list of places faculty might be able to publish their results and their content. And maybe they already know and they don't need help with something like that. But that was a impetus for me. Saving money for students was certainly the major thing. And, uh, and there you go. Uh, so that's pretty much it. For what I've got to say, these are the dates again for the proposals and the progress report. And then there's, uh, oh, I should have deleted that. That was from Kathy's old presentation. But if you've got any questions, I'd love to hear them. Wow, I must have been super clear. Or super boring. I don't have any questions, Ruth, but that was very helpful. And I appreciate you sharing um, your slides with us as well. Great. Well, then I'll leave you with one other thought, thinking about what an OER plan looks like. You know, with, the, with sources that aren't textbooks, you know, maybe the plan would also look like the faculty doing development in fall and doing implementation in spring. Because if you're going to pull a course together and get a lot of different sources and, and build a course from free materials that isn't a textbook, you know, really time consuming. But assign time with the promise of uh, payoff in, you know, in having it free for the fall term, you know, maybe that's a good way to approach a proposal. So how are you guys doing? Are your universities excited about this, or is it at a painful stage right now? Hi, this is Linda. Um, I think we've kind of not been involved with the um, ALS to begin with, so now we're looking at both of these more seriously. And I think the hardest thing is going to be getting the right players, because the bookstore is doing something, the library is doing something. We're not really working together. We're just starting to create a conversation. Um, so I think number one is going to be getting the right people together. And then the second thing is going to be actually creating a plan. So I'm definitely going to be participating in all the webinars to see what other folks have been doing. And if you have any suggestions, I'm certainly open to it. Yeah, and it's such a short timeline to get all those people. The year is almost over. And to get all those people together, you know, it's tough. Um, Cal Poly, same thing. Our, E-learning instructional designers are are not part of ALI, and the, and they really should be, you know, I because I see the success at San Marcos, and I think, boy, we are we got because they see faculty that are ready to change their courses, and they can give them good advice on what needs to be done, and save them a lot of grief and things like that, uh, and our our affordable learning committee hardly ever meets. We never, and you're, it's exactly what you've got. The library separate from the bookstore, separate from uh, the faculty. And finding faculty and making them even aware that there's an option and talking them into putting their time in, because it could be a lot of work and stuff. It is. It's hard to pull everyone together and finding the right players. I think you're right. So what we've done here, our librarian, who's very well known on campus, our uh, 
she's uh, emailed several departments that looked like they had promising, like they'd be interested, and I'm going to email her today and say, hey, has anyone responded? And uh, we'll see. Okay, I guess we're done. But if you have any questions or want to talk about anything, feel free to contact me or anyone on the council. And I'll put my email right in the bottom there. And good luck to you. Thanks again, Ruth. This was great. All right. Bye. Thanks. Yep. Nice meeting you. That's good. I was a half hour. I think that yeah. went pretty well. Yeah. It was, um, everyone, everyone seemed to make it in all right. No technical problems. Okay. So that was good. Great. Monday. So you're, you're yeah, <laughs> now Monday. Oh, and let uh, me look at their comments. Did they say anything? Oh, hardest thing is getting the right players. There actually is a webinar. Oh, that is the Monday webinar. Yeah. Oh, good, and you gave them the link for the courses, because I think that's a good place to start. Go find the people who are teaching yeah. that course and say, think about it. All right. Yeah. Well, have a good yeah. weekend. Okay. Yeah, you too. Okay, I'll bye. to you on Monday. Okay, bye.